Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is Ten to Life. I apologize again, my voice is still pretty hoarse. I'm actually going to the doctor later today to see what the heck is going on. And obviously a new background. I'm trying to make it a little bit cleaner and simplify things a bit. This thing, this macrame thing ain't staying behind me. So just stay patient with me. We're going to work it all out and I will have a permanent backdrop coming to you guys very, very soon. Okay, guys, so Lauren Smith Fields is a 23 year old college student. Like so many young adults, she was using dating apps to meet new people, connect with new friends, and new love interests. And the app that she particularly was fond of was Bumble. And on December 11th, 2021, Lauren met who seemed to be a promising man through Bumble and had decided that she wanted to meet up with him. However, what she didn't plan on was that the following morning, she would be found dead in her bed. And more than that, nobody was asking the questions as to why or what happened. So smash that like button and let's get into it. Ten to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. Lauren Smith Fields is a 23 year old YouTuber who attended Stanford High School in Connecticut, where she was a track star. She now attends Norwalk Community College, where she's studying to be a cosmetologist, but has also expressed interest in physical therapy. Lauren loves to travel, she loves fashion, and she just loves being with her friends and family. And as you can see from these photos, Lauren is absolutely stunning. She, you can see that there is just this sort of man, magnetic energy and pull about her. I don't know. I was going through these photos and I just can't believe how beautiful this young woman is. She's also described as family members by the absolute light in our family. Like so many other young adults, Lauren was an avid Bumble user. And for those of you who aren't familiar, Bumble is an online dating app. And basically it's when you're looking for somebody to connect with, whether it's platonic, whether whether it's romantic, it just gives you options of other people who are in a nearby radius and who also are looking to connect with somebody. Now, I personally haven't used Bumble. I've used similar dating apps, so I don't know if it works the exact same, but basically, like the gist of it is that you swipe on different profiles, either left or right, depending on if you like them and you're interested or if you're not interested. And then if that person swiped that they were interested in you as well, you have the opportunity to private message each other, connect, and ultimately set up a time to meet should you choose to. And Lauren did meet somebody. She connected with a 37-year-old man named Matt LaFountain. And I don't know exactly if it's pronounced LaFountain or La LaFontaine. So we're just going to go with LaFountain. And I know that probably sounds horrible and I'm probably butchering it, but whatever. That's what we're going to say. So she and Matt connect, and after three days of talking, they decide that they are going to meet up together for an in-person, in-real-life date at Lauren's apartment, and this was on the night of December 11th, 2021. According to reports, Matt and Lauren started the evening by having fun, getting to know each other, and taking tequila shots. However, suddenly, Lauren ended up getting very sick. She ultimately recovered and bounced back, and she and Matt continued to play games with each other, eat food, and then watched a movie. At some point, Lauren reportedly went to the bathroom on her own for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then when she returned back to the couch to watch the movie, she fell asleep. Matt then carried Lauren to her bed, she was asleep, and then he fell asleep next to her. Now, I just want to say, I personally don't like this. I don't like that he stayed at her apartment and fell asleep, and that's just my personal opinion, because it's the first time you're meeting someone, and why are you spending the night unless he was explicitly invited to? But... At this point, you both have been drinking, possibly to the point where Lauren was sick. She's now has fallen asleep or, you know, perhaps passed out from the alcohol, who knows? And now you're just carrying her to bed while she's asleep and you're gonna spend the night there as well. Now, while some may argue it's because he maybe was intoxicated as well and didn't wanna drive, there's always Uber, my friends. There's just something I don't like about this, especially since it was the first time that they met. I feel like you don't know her well enough to spend the night. She's possibly under the influence. Just leave, let her sleep, just leave. And again, that's just my personal opinion. So then apparently Matt wakes up around 3 a.m. He goes to the bathroom, he hears Lauren snoring beside him, and then he goes back to bed. Well, then he wakes back up at 6.30 a.m. and he sees an entirely different version of Lauren. Matt apparently looks to the other side of the bed where Lauren was lying, and she's lying on her side with blood coming out of her right nostril. He also says that she's not breathing. Matt immediately calls 911 to get first responders out to that apartment. Now, while talking to investigators and first responders, an interesting thing to note is Matt had claimed that Lauren had asked him earlier that day for $40 to go get her nails done and then said afterwards, go ahead and come to my apartment. 
And while that may not be a big detail, we're going to get to it a little bit later in the video. He also says that he did not have sex with Lauren. He says that he remained fully clothed and just laid on the bed beside her. But again, why are you spending the night? And I mean, not to say that you can't have platonic sleepovers, but why are you spending the night, especially if you weren't like hooking up and she was asleep and she had been drinking? The whole thing just kind of irks me a little bit. But what's most interesting about that statement to me, and we'll get to why here in a bit, is that he is adamant that they did not have sex and that he was fully clothed. And you'll see why in a little bit here. Officials arrive and Lauren was pronounced dead at 6.49 a.m. And they say that it appears that she had been dead for at least an hour or so prior to that time of death. A police report is of course filed and Matt's versions of events and what happened that night and that fateful morning are entered onto this report. So let's read that. Here you can see it says, reporting officer was dispatched to 33 Plymouth Street on a report of a non-responsive female. Medics and fire were dispatched as well. Upon arrival, a knock on the door was answered by a frantic man, later identified as, and his name is redacted here, but it is Matt LaFountain, LaFontaine, whatever. He directed me to the rear of the apartment to a bedroom. There I observed a young adult black female lying on her back on the floor. She had dried blood in and around her right nostril. She did not appear to be breathing. He told me that the person on the phone had instructed him to do chest compressions. He picked up his phone and asked if he should keep doing them. He was trembling and visibly shaken. The call taker told him to hang up and to speak with me. I told him the medics were on the way and the sirens could be heard in the distance. I asked what her name was and he replied, Lauren. When asked for her last name, he said he wasn't sure. But then he says that her Instagram page says, and it goes on to say who she was identified as. Now, as all of this is happening, nobody from the police department or the hospital contacted anyone in Lauren's family. They had been trying to get in touch with her all day on Sunday just to check in, to talk, to touch base, and all of those attempts were of course unsuccessful because little did they know their family member, their beloved family member, was lying deceased in a basement hospital somewhere and nobody had alerted her family. Ultimately, after not being able to get in touch with Lauren all day on Sunday, the family goes to her apartment. They want to check in on her, make sure everything's okay, but upon their arrival, they discovered a note on her front door, and the note was taped and it read, if you're looking for Lauren, call this number, and it had been left by the building's landlord. So the family makes contact with the landlord and officials, and they receive the absolutely heartbreaking news that their 23-year-old beloved family member is no longer alive. The family said that once they had reached out to the detective, he confirmed that Lauren had passed away and that she had met a man through Bumble, the dating app site. Now, despite Matt being the last known person to have been with Lauren, the Bridgeport Police Department didn't further question him, and they didn't arrest him, and they say it's because he seemed like a nice guy. And that is a direct quote, guys. So when the family asked the officer about him, the detective says that he was a very nice guy and that they weren't looking into him any further. And the family states that it was almost as though this detective was sticking up for him. And it seemed very weird to hear that from a detective because normally you would want to investigate all parties involved, especially the person who was last known to have been seen with this person. Not long after, the coroner's initial report on the physical evidence came out, and this report determined that there was no foul play involved. Okay, so then what happened if there was no foul play? Was this an accident? Was this a possible OD? What happened here? And what happened to this beautiful 23-year-old girl? The family wanted answers. They wanted to know who was with Lauren, what happened, and to make some sort of sense about this entire situation. However, the family didn't hear back from police for 16 days, from that Monday the 13th all the way through December 29th they did not hear back from police. The holidays came and went without Lauren with no answers as to what happened. And I can't imagine what that family must have been feeling in those moments and going through because you're going through a season and a holiday that's all about family, love, togetherness. And not only are you mourning the loss of one of your family members that died unexpectedly, but you also don't have any answers as to why. Why did you lose your daughter? Why did you lose your sister? Why did you lose your friend? You have no real answers as to why they aren't there celebrating the holidays with you. The family attorney alleges that the original officer, Detective Kevin Cronin, disregarded basic protocol when first responding to this case, including failing to properly notify any of Lauren's family members of the death. 
And Lauren's mother had spoken out and she said, how do I not get any notification that my daughter has passed away? I don't even get grieving time at all because I've now been thrown into this craziness. Obviously just extremely frustrated and also confused as to how this is happening. Not long after, Lauren's family went to Lauren's apartment to begin moving out her things. And in a moment in which it was, of course, already, I'm sure, heartbreaking and traumatizing, you're packing up your daughter's things, you're moving them out because she died unexpectedly. In the process of doing all of this, a new detective just shows up. Now, not only did nobody tell the family that a new detective was assigned to the case, but nobody told the family that a detective was going to be arriving to the scene that day. So they are caught completely by surprise. And this new detective tells the family, and I quote, the previous detective messed up and didn't know what he was doing, and he messed up the case. Now, first of all, even if that were true, why would you say that to a family while they're grieving, while they're packing things up, while they're putting her belongings in boxes? Why are you putting that worry into their mind and slashing any hope that they may have had that the police just simply hadn't been in touch because they were working the case? They were solving the case and figuring out what happened. Now you're saying, oh, no, 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 the case was completely botched and the detective handled it completely wrong and now I'm the new detective. That same day, CSI arrived for the very first time to Lauren's apartment, and Lauren's family gave them quite a few important pieces of evidence and belongings that were found in that apartment. Lauren's family gave CSI a bloody sheet and a pill that was found inside her apartment that they suspect to be a sedative. There was also a big circle of blood in the middle of the bed with streaks going to the right side. Now, this could have been when Matt allegedly pulled Lauren off of the bed onto the floor to start those chest compressions. However, it hasn't been confirmed either way, which you will see why in just a minute. They also turn over two drinks next to a bottle and a condom that was found inside Lauren's bathroom trash can that still had semen inside of it. Now, here's what gets me. Nothing had been taken from this scene or apartment prior to this day. There was no crime scene ever processed. And the police didn't take those cups either to test the liquor to see what was inside and if maybe something was dropped in or laced in. Nothing had been taken. Nothing had been collected. So if the apartment wasn't processed and if evidence wasn't collected, how much evidence has been lost at this point, has been damaged at this point? Because in fact, the only items that the Bridgeport Police Department took and confiscated were allegedly her phone, her passport, and $1,300 in cash, but they neglected to retrieve any of these other key pieces of evidence. On January 21st, the family's attorney issued a statement with the intent to sue the Bridgeport Police Department for negligence. Our daughter, their sister, our loved one, they they thought they was going to just throw her away like she was garbage. Amid this family's anguish are emotions of outrage and disgust at how the Bridgeport Police Department has investigated the mysterious death of 23-year-old Lauren Smith Fields. It was careless. It was no concern. There was no, like, care for the family about how we felt, our grief, our pain, none of that. The whole day goes by. No police reach out to the family at all. Her close-knit family says they went to the apartment the next day after frantically calling and texting Lauren and were referred to a Detective Cronin. They didn't even contact us. They didn't let us know anything. It's like crazy. And I'm asking him what's going on. He said she met some guy on Bumble. And I'm asking him about the guy. He was like, oh, he sounds like a really nice guy. He sounds like a really good guy. And he was like, "Uh, I'll call you back. I just hung up in my face. They say the detective promised to come by the apartment. Never showed up. The family's says the relationship with police devolved from there. No contact from December 13th until December 29th. They returned to the apartment to clear out Lauren's belongings and claim a new detective came by to say he'd taken over the case from Detective Cronin. Detective said he effed up, he messed up. He effed Cronin, he messed up. He like, he didn't know what he was doing. He messed up the case. The family says they provided evidence they'd collected to crime scene investigators who arrived for the first time that day. 
included a bloody sheet and a pill. And two cups of like drinks or whatever next to a bottle. They didn't take none of that. We seen a condom. We seen a uh, lube, uh, other stuff in there. And they didn't take none of this. And coincidentally, just one day after that announcement was made, Lauren's autopsy was released, an autopsy that the family has been trying to get their hands on. Connecticut Office of the Chief Medical Examiner released Lauren's autopsy results, saying that she died from an overdose, and it was acute intoxication due to the combined effects of fentanyl, promethazine, hydroxine, and alcohol. Her death has been ruled an accident. Lauren's family and their attorney is absolutely adamant, though, that Lauren did not do drugs and very rarely drank liquor. And they say that she regularly went to the gym. She was in great health, according to them. And... I feel like maybe part of this is true, which we of course don't know, but if she did in fact get sick that night after those few shots of tequila, like Matt suggested, is that because she really did rarely drink? Who knows? The attorney also says the question is less of what toxins were in her body, but how they got there. Who introduced these drugs into Lauren's system? Now let's shift gears here a little bit and talk a little bit more about Matt. To date, Matt has not reached out to any of Lauren's family members. Now, if he was the last person and to have seen Lauren and he feels bad and he's heartbroken for the family, why wouldn't he at least reach out to the family to offer them some sort of condolences or to let them know what happened that night just to, again, say, yeah, we were drinking, I don't know what happened, I woke up here. It, why, as an innocent person, have you not reached out to the family once? That genuinely cared and they were there, the last person there, and they know that nothing bad happened, you would at least even reach out to the family yourself. Like, exactly. listen, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss of your daughter or your sister. And more than that, he has lawyered up. Apparently, police were about to request a DNA sample from Matt, and that is right when he hired a lawyer. So to me, it just feels all too suspicious. And let me explain why. Remember, Lauren was pronounced dead at 6.49 a.m., but that the report had stated that she was dead for at least an hour or so more. That would put her true time of death around 5.49 a.m. or earlier. But remember, Matt also says that he woke up at 3 a.m. and that Lauren was sound asleep and snoring next to him. So she would have had to die then within a two and a half hour window or less because he woke up around three o'clock. They're saying that she died before, either at 5.49 a.m. or earlier, tightening that window to approximately a two and a half hour window of opportunity. Now that means that she would have had to have awakened from a deep snoring sleep after 3 a.m., get out of her bed without waking Matt up, and randomly decide to ingest this deadly drug and cocktail by herself. Then go and lay back down in bed without waking Matt up, all within this two and a half to three hour window. And sure, she could have ingested the drugs prior to even going to sleep that evening. And then after several hours, the drugs worked their way into her system and potentially causing an overdose effect or something of that nature. And trust me, I'm no drug expert, guys, but I find it hard to believe that she was sleeping soundly and healthily all the way up until 3 a.m. And then all of a sudden, things took a t quick turn for the worse in just a matter of a couple of hours. It's possible, sure, but again, I don't know. I'm no drug expert. What do you guys think? And to me, the fact that Matt won't give DNA is a red flag. And while it usually wouldn't be, because I know that there is a lot of mixed opinions out there of even if you're innocent, if you should give DNA. So while it maybe normally wouldn't be, it's a red flag to me because I think that they could potentially match his DNA with that semen that was found in the condom in Lauren's bathroom. And remember, he says that they did not have sex and that he remained fully clothed. So if that is his DNA, and if that's why he's reluctant to give his DNA because he knows it's going to be a match, he would have clearly lied about there being no sexual relations happening between the two, and it would then open up the question as to what else he has lied about. Now, I'm thinking a more likely scenario, and again, this is just my opinion, guys, is that Lauren and Matt hung out that night. They were taking shots, they were having fun, and then Lauren got sick. But at some point during the night, I think that Lauren was either given something that was maybe cut with Fent, and I'm abbreviating it here because I don't know if YouTube's going to be flagging me, and I think that she either took something you know, on her own or with Matt that was accidentally cut with that unknowingly, or I think that perhaps 
it was maybe put into our drink, not maybe fent directly, but maybe again, something that had been unknowingly laced with that. Maybe this was an accidental laced drug and Matt and Lauren both decided to partake, or maybe this was given to Lauren without her knowledge. If she was given it without her knowledge, was it to ensure that sexual activity would take place? Did Matt feel like Lauren owed him for some reason? Because remember, allegedly, according to him, he paid for her nails earlier that day. So did he think that she somehow owed him for that? And now he was at his apartment and, or, and now he was at her apartment and he was going to, you know, cash out did they have sex whether consensual or not and is that dna in the condom belonging to matt if it was all an accident and if it were a street drug that was laced with fent which we do see happen so often these days why the secrecy and why the lawyer unless matt is just in extreme panic and he doesn't want to admit to even doing drugs period but if they were both partaking in drinking and doing drugs and then it was accidentally laced with fentanyl first of all why would it only have affected her and not him would be my first question but also then why are you not forthcoming with those details and again just my opinion but i feel like since she was the only one affected by this i don't believe that he ingested any drugs which Hi, we wouldn't know about because, spoiler alert, and we're going to get to this in a minute, he was never actually even like officially questioned, no, no drug test, no anything. But also, I think that if she's the only one who had ingested it, to me it seems more likely that it was given to her unknowingly rather than her sneaking off in the middle of the night into her bathroom to ingest drugs after she's already been asleep for several hours. And as if this case and investigation isn't already messy enough, the family attorney said that those key pieces of evidence and items collected by CSI at Lauren's apartment, including the sheets, the bottles, the mixture, the condom, everything, has still not yet been submitted to the state lab for forensic analysis. Not only did they retrieve the evidence late, but now it's just parked there and it hasn't even been analyzed yet. Like, what is going on here? In another spin in all of this, Bumble, that dating app, has also spoken out, and they say that they have been in touch with the police, but that the police have not asked them for any information or any data. They haven't asked for messages that Lauren and Matt had exchanged. They aren't asking for previous messages with other users that perhaps Matt had, Matt had met with that had a similar result or something happened or even to use as a character witness, literally nothing. Now that also gives Matt all of this opportunity to start cleaning things up, cover his tracks, delete messages if needed, and do whatever he wants. While I'm sure some of it is saved in like metadata and all of that, I just still can't understand that if Bumble has reached out to the police offering to help, they aren't processing evidence, they are not asking questions, They are not looking into the message history and exchanges between Lauren and Matt to see what the dynamic truly was. They're not doing anything, in my opinion. Do your freaking job. Lauren's father, Everett Smith, has said that he paid for a second autopsy out of pocket because of how this investigation has been being handled. And this second report has not yet been completed, but hopefully that will be completed very soon. Many people in the public are, of course, outraged. And a lot of people actually are viewing this as a racial divide because Matt who is a white man, has not yet been charged, detained, or fully investigated. Now, I'm not going to get into all of that on this channel, and I don't want all of you guys in the comments or in the chat getting political. Please don't. I just want to report that is what a lot of the climate out there surrounding this case, that is what is happening right now. And this case has also sparked an outcry on social media, particularly on TikTok and Instagram, with people calling for justice for Lauren. And fellow YouTube and true crime sleuths and other TikTok creators have all been posting about this case for weeks, sharing local news stories about the family's struggle to get any answers, posting photos of Lauren, posting photos of Matt, anything to just get recognition, get answers, and ultimately get justice for Lauren. Even celebrities like Cardi B are starting to draw attention to her death and post about it. So after what seemed like a very grim six weeks of everything kind of being on pause, no answers, nothing, six weeks after Lauren was found, Connecticut detectives have now officially opened up a criminal investigation into Lauren's death. (sighs) About time. 
This is exactly what we have been screaming and crying for. Reaction from the attorney representing Lauren Smithfield's family after learning Bridgeport police narcotics and vice detectives with assistance from the federal DEA will now investigate what led to the death of the 23-year-old fitness buff in her apartment last month. Yesterday, the office of the medical examiner ruled her death an accident, saying she overdosed on a combination of fentanyl, prescription drugs, and alcohol. According to this police report, what we obtained an older man who said he had met Lauren on a dating app called 911, but there is no mention of drugs in the narrative. So fentanyl is a top drug, and then they have a, a couple other drugs they found in her system that are typically associated with drugs. And so we want to know the source of that stuff. We don't know how they spoke to the man, if they questioned him. We don't know anything. As far as we know, they just gave him a pat on the back. In an exclusive sit-down interview with us last week, the family accused detectives of mishandling the investigation from the beginning, failing to collect evidence, and refusing to provide any information on the status of the probe. In a statement, the police chief read, the Bridgeport Police Department continues to treat the untimely death of Lauren Smith Fields as an active investigation, as we are now refocusing our attention and efforts to the factors that led to her untimely death. And this development comes after Lauren's family said, again, that she did not use drugs, and they questioned if the police had investigated and how that fatal concoction that Lauren ingested had even been administered into her body. Lauren's family's attorney writes on Twitter and says, I've never seen a medical examiner conclude a mixture of drugs as an accident without knowing who provided the drugs or how it was ingested. The medical examiner findings doesn't cure any of Bridgeport Police Department's lack of process. In fact, it makes it worse. As a result of a botched investigation, this morning we are left with more questions than answers. And actually, a Democrat in the state legislature announced just this last Tuesday that he is now introducing a bill in Lauren's honor requiring police that they must notify family in Connecticut of a family member's death within 24 hours, which should have already been standard in my opinion, but at least now, like, hopefully there is actually a law behind it. The family sent the following letter to city leaders last month, and I'm going to pull this up on the screen and I'm going to read it to you. It's a long one, but it's very important and I, I believe very telling. Good afternoon. I am writing this email on behalf of the Smith Fields family. I am writing this email completely concerned and disheartened not only as a family member of the victim, but a citizen and taxpayer in the state of Connecticut. On Monday, December 13th, my family began to call and text our beloved daughter, sister, niece, and friend, Lauren Smith Fields, continuously with no prevail. With Lauren being such the family-oriented young woman that she was, we knew this was completely out of character for her not to respond. Around approximately 8 p.m., Lauren's mother and brother decided to go to Lauren's home at 33 Plymouth Street. Upon their arrival, they were met with a note on the door stating, if you're looking for Lauren, call this number. Completely confused and frightened, Lauren's mother and brother contacted Lauren's landlord Hector. Hector then informed them that something bad happened and that Lauren was indeed deceased. Hector then proceeded to give them a card with Detective Cronin's phone number on it. Lauren's brother then called Detective Cronin. I mean, I can't even imagine finding out the information that way that you lost a loved one. It's just awful. When Detective Cronin spoke with Lauren's brother, he told him that Lauren was indeed expired and her body had been removed from the scene. He told him that Lauren met a man later identified as Matt LaFountain on a dating website called Bumble for the first time. He explained that Mr. LaFountain came to visit Lauren and that she seemed to be feeling ill. He further went into detail and told Mr. Jetter, Lauren's brother, that Mr. LaFountain stated Lauren went to meet him at 9.30 p.m., stayed outside for a few minutes, came back, and began to vomit uncontrollably. Controllably. Detective Cronin then told Lauren's brother that Mr. LaFountain also stated that he carried her into bed and laid with her, checking on her twice, once at 3 a.m. and the next at 6.30 a.m., when he noticed she was bleeding out of her nose and mouth. The brother then asked the detective, are you investigating this? He responded and said, I don't think there is anything to investigate. He seems like a really great guy. I was here when the medical examiner investigated and there are no signs of foul play and they were both fully dressed. Detective Cronin then stated that he would be willing to come to the scene at 33 Plymouth Street and speak with them, and they agreed. They continued to wait in front of the home, upset, grieving, and confused for 45 minutes to be unmet with to be unmet with Detective Cronin or anyone from the Bridgeport Police Department. 
The brother and mother then left the scene of incident and gave Detective Cronin's phone number to Lauren's father, Everett Smith. Mr. Smith then called Detective Cronin to clarify then the information given earlier to Lauren's brother. When Mr. Smith called Detective Cronin, he was met with a response that said, I already talked to your ex-wife and you can talk to her. I mean, honestly, guys, the nerve of this guy. Mr. Smith then stated that he had his own questions that he wanted to ask Detective Cronin that were not previously asked. Detective Cronin then said it was late, he was off work, and could not continue to communicate. Upset and feeling like they were not being heard, Mr. Jetter called Detective Cronin again for Detective Cronin to answer and say, why do you keep calling me? I told you everything I know, and continued to hang up in his face. I mean, guys, this detective... And I believe this is the one who is being investigated right now by internal affairs. But like, wow, wow. Talk about, first of all, like unprofessional, but also like just no bedside manner, no etiquette. After taking a day to process on this tragedy and wait for law enforcement to gather more information and potentially visit or contact us, we decided to visit the Bridgeport Police Department on Wednesday, December 16th. In the lobby, we asked to speak with Detective Cronin and was told he was off for the day and that there was a different detective on duty that they would be able to speak with. While meeting with this detective, they explained what information they had in great detail. The detective seemed utterly appalled and shocked at the way the family was talked to, ignored, and kept uninformed. As of today, Thursday, December 16th, 2021, we still have not spoken with Detective Cronin nor anyone else from the Bridgeport Police Department. We have questions for this detective, captain, and chief. My main question to all of you is since when is an investigation based on somebody being a good guy or a good person? Or does Detective Cronin know that Mr. LaFountain, as he, as he is a resident of Milford, Milford, which is only about 6 to 10 miles away from Bridgeport, in the police force, are investigations initiated based on personal belief of someone's character or evidence provided? If investigations are initiated based on evidence presented, then how was an investigation not properly performed? Based on the incident report provided to us today, it was stated that Lauren was bleeding from her nose and mouth. How does this explain a pool of blood in the middle of her bed and not at the head of the bed where her pillow was where she was lying? We were told by Detective Cronin that Lauren and Mr. Fountain did not engage in any intercourse as per Mr. Fountain's word, but how would Detective Cronin know? This morning, we found a used Trojan condom in Lauren's bathroom trash can that was left on the scene. Did Detective Cronin see the condom in the bathroom? We also found an open tube of lubricant on her dresser that was half full. This tube was a small miniature tube used for a one-time use. Did he bother to even look around the home or based on his judgment on Mr. Fountain being a good guy, did he not bother to check? Before we hire a private investigator, I would like to formally invite and insist detectives return and gather the evidence that was found by our family and overlooked by detectives. If this condom were tested and it was indeed holding semen from Mr. LaFountain, proving what he stated was not true and him and Lauren indeed had intercourse, would he still be considered a good guy? I, along with the voters in the state, demand better not only from our police department, but our local officials. I also would like to schedule a meeting with our family and your detectives and officers involved with this case. Our beloved daughter, sister, niece, and friend deserves to have her death properly investigated by our authorities who we are supposed to trust and are supposed to serve us. Again, investigations should not be based on personal belief. We understand that the medical examiner was at the scene and saw no foul play in the human eye, but what if she finds different during her autopsy? Will an investigation start then? Or by then, would it be too late to review and collect physical evidence? I will close this first email of many by further expressing my hurt, anger, and absolute disgust at how my grieving family was talked to and treated during this difficult time. My family deserves a heartfelt apology and a thorough investigation into the untimely death of Lauren Smithfields. If an investigation determines Lauren's untimely death was not suspicious or was not led to by neglect of any kind, we will take that information with stride and work as a family to begin to heal from this tragedy. But if for any reason this continues to drag on and any of Mr. LaFountain's statements are proven to be false, uncorroborated, and complete lies through an independent investigation, we will not rest until everyone is held accountable for their actions. I look forward to speaking with you soon and am open to meeting as soon as possible. I mean, a very powerful and well-written letter, in my opinion. Just 
simply in a very polite way asking for answers while also trying to hold those accountable who have failed Lauren miserably. So what do you guys think? Do you think that this was foul play? Do you think that this was an accident? What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments below. I hope that Lauren's family starts to receive answers in this case and ultimately I hope that we receive justice for Lauren because there was just so many missteps in my opinion from the start, the investigation, the follow-up, I mean the whole thing, it's just like so done so so poorly honestly in my opinion. So I'm going to follow closely because I want to let you guys know too as soon as updates happen and as we learn more, I wonder what that second autopsy is going to show if it's going to yield different results i wonder if matt will ever formally be questioned and if they will get dna and test it against the found condom at the scene i have a lot of questions guys so meanwhile if you would like to donate to the family you can do so here at their gofundme and that will help reimburse them for those second autopsy expenses as well as other expenses that the family is facing so if you would like to donate go ahead and do so and you can find the gofundme here Thanks for tuning in with me today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the coverage. Please share this, like this, do whatever you can to help the algorithm on this video in order to spread Lauren's story out there and get it out there. Because again, one of the biggest pieces of frustration in this out there in the public is that nobody seems to be wanting to talk about it. And how do you not talk about something like this that clearly has so many red flags and missteps along the way? You can't just bury it. You can't just sweep it under the rug. So please show your support for Lauren's family, show your support for Lauren, and let's push this story out there as far and as wide as possible. Thanks again for tuning in with me today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the coverage. Subscribe if you haven't, and I will keep you updated in Lauren's case. Until the next case, stay safe. Bye.